All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, guten Morgen. For those of you who speak a little bit of German, um, uh, it was a pretty good party last night, wasn't it? So, yeah, I'm, I'm glad there's at least a bunch of people out uh, this morning. So, um, <coughs> I'm here today uh, to talk to you guys because I believe that every mobile app should be uh, tested through automation. I should probably take the time real quick. Um, so, um, what I'm going to show you is um, why I believe we should be doing this. And the great thing about it is that the, the technologies that I'm going to use, which is Atmium, um, Apache Cordova, also known as PhoneGap, and uh, TopCode, they're all backed by JavaScript or web technology. So it's, you know, for this conference, pretty relevant. So <clears throat> I have a little cold, so excuse my um, like small breaks uh, in between. Um, so the reason why, I, like one of the reasons why I believe uh, every mobile app should be tested through automation is the fact that um, there's a paradigm shift going on right now, um, especially like consumers, like people that are not professionals that use uh, com like that not use they are not using a computer on a daily basis to do their work. They're increasingly using more mobile devices to you know use the internet and like whatever is out there. So th there's a shift from like the old school desktop uh, browser-based app to mobile apps, and. Um, you know, like mobile devices like uh, smartphones are getting increasingly more popular, cheaper because technology, you know, um, evolves. And, you know, it's only, it's only progressing, it's only getting more. Um, that is great because it also uh, opens up a lot, you know, new opportunities uh, business-wise and just, you know, building awesome stuff. So uh, one of the examples are obviously Instagram, very popular. I mean, they were founded a couple of years ago and blew up in like no time. Um, <clears throat> another good example is like Lyft or any of those transportation companies that um, use the fact that a mobile device is so much more in the context of a real life because it's more like a person carries it um, with him or her wherever they go. It's not like you're going to a computer in your room, like you, you're always bringing the phone. So you have the advantage of having the device embedded in the, in the context of a person's life, meaning it knows the location, and it has all kinds of other like, information available that you just don't get out of a browser or like, out of a desktop browser. And uh, a really good example also is like, uh, wearables, like the Nike Fuel Band. Um, uh, you know, like it, it actually uses um, information that it collects throughout the day and then syncs it up with your mobile phone and like, presents to you what you've been up to, like activity-wise and all that kind of stuff. That's just, I wouldn't necessarily say it's impossible on a computer, but uh, the entry barrier is way lower for uh, mobile devices and mobile apps uh, to do that. So <clears throat> it's great that we get new opportunities and all that, but like, opportunities also come with challenges. So um, that's kind of exciting, uh, but it also can be very frustrating. And you know, one of the challenges is obviously that there's not just one mobile phone and there's not just one operating system out there. And in particular for, uh, for the mobile world, yeah, you know, the contenders are like iOS, Android, um, BlackBerry, uh, Windows Phone, and, and maybe Symbian, not so much anymore, but you, you get it. It's, there's, like, there's like a multitude of platforms. Um, another problem is that these platforms run on like all kinds of devices, so it's not a standard device. Everyone has the same one. Everyone has an iPhone. There are like plenty of devices. This is like a chart that I took from a blog post, and um, it's the data of July 2012, and it shows you how popular certain devices are. And, um, <clears throat> I can't really show this right now because it's not interactive, but um, the way they did that is like uh, they, they show how it progressed over time and it moves around really fast. So, you know, all of a sudden a new phone comes out and like it's tossed into the mix. And the problem is it, you know, has very different screen sizes. Um, this is a chart that basically kind of shows you how many different screen sizes there are. Like obviously like more in a, in a symbolic way, not like, you know, at scale. Um, uh, the, in the other interesting thing, or like the other thing that's very challenging, is that like most of these devices have different memory, different uh, CPUs, uh, you know, different technology. So it's not that easy to uh, like provide a unified experience to all users um, um, using you know just a single technology. Um, another really big problem that brings me back to this test automation statement that I made is um, the way you distribute apps. Um, is very different from like deploying a website and using a browser and like hitting it. It's like these days they are like you know app stores. You you submit an app to an app store and that's the way people find your app, discover it, and download it and use it. Uh, the problem with that is, I mean, it's great. It's not really a problem. It's great because it uh, is a unified way for 
uh, non-technical people to get hold of you know, great uh, apps that provide great, uh, great experiences and great services. Um, the problem that comes with that is, particularly for a certain platform, you have to submit your app, and if you're lucky, um, it actually makes it into the App Store in like a two weeks' time or so. But it can sometimes be like you know, a month or, or five, uh, because there's a review process attached to it. Like, they want to make sure that you don't steal data from their users and that you're using the platform in a, in a let's say, like regulated way, like in a sandboxed way. And um, the way that works is like you make a change, you want to get it out there, you have to submit it to the App Store and go through all this process. So essentially, um, it's not as easy as like running a website where you can deploy at will because it's your service, you're running it, people hit it from their uh, desktop browsers. It's more like uh, you make a change and then you have one shot and then like you have to wait two weeks or cancel it and like you definitely have to wait a time until it actually hits the app store and people update it. And then it's also up to the people to actually up update or upgrade to the latest version. Um, so one thing that really uh, you know is key here is uh, quality assurance, right? So when you have one shot, you want to be you know you want to be sure that when you actually you know go ahead and you're submitting the app to the app store, that um, you know essentially this app is is bug free, or at least the functionality that you want to provide to the users, you have a confidence that it's working. And um, there's a really common way of um, doing this, which is called dog fooding. So companies uh, go ahead and like serve a development version to their employees. Like I think Facebook does that because they have a lot of employees, and everyone kind of has to use Facebook in a way. Even though I'm a bigger fan of Twitter, um, but the thing is, um, they kind of like um, dependent on like people using it, hitting bugs, and then filing reports to actually get some sort of uh, QA process in there. But it's kind of up to coincidence. It's not really systematical, and it's definitely not automated. At least uh, the the testing part of it. Um, Another thing is like you can't really execute some sort of test case repetitively because you're like literally just kind of probing the app. Like people just use it. It's not there's no system to it. There's no there's no test plan to it. And even if if there were one, um, it's really you know hard to repeat that on a frequent basis and uh, you know quickly. Um, obviously, you want to find bugs before your app, your users do it. That's kind of like the bottom line of all that. So um, you know like that all that said and all these variety of platforms and screen sizes and all that, um, there's like this, um, this initiative uh, in this you know, app development world which goes in the area that like, instead of like, using some native programming language like Objective-C or like Android, why not just using you know, web technologies to build apps? Because we all, you know, most of us in the room here probably uh, are either you know, building websites already or have built websites. But you know, there's a there's a standard here, or there are standards already, and they will accept it, and and they work in the browser. So why not using them? Uh, Firefox OS is a really good example. They're kind of embracing that to the to the full extent. Um, the other platforms are not quite there yet, mostly because of performance reasons. Um, it's it's not quite competitive yet. But you know, we'll see what happens in the future. So my idea here, what I'm going to demo here, is like an approach that actually uses web technologies to build an app that's cross-platform. Um, so. Um, I'm using um, uh, Apache Cordova, which is also known as PhoneGap. And um, I found this really good app online. Uh, it's from Christoph. I really don't know how to pronounce his last name, so I'm not going to attempt it. Um, but he built this app, and I just basically took it and extended it a little bit. And uh, I'm just going to show you guys what I'm talking about real quick. So this is obviously an iPhone simulator. It's really simple. It's an uh, employee di directory. <coughs> you can just search. Um, you can scroll through the list. You know, you click on things, you just get more information. You can like, you know, hit the call button. It will call the person, or at least it will simulate a call. Um, and yeah, it's overall looks pretty great because Topco does a really good job. It's kind of like the Twitter bootstrap of um, of uh, mobile apps. Like, if you like like myself and you don't have a really good hand for design, you may as well just use you know something that is already you know pretty good looking. Um, but overall, it's a pretty simple app. Um, the emphasis of my talk is obvi obviously the testing aspect, so I'm not like a full-on Cordova developer. Um, all right, so yeah, I just talked about that. Um, yeah, Cordova is basically the attempt to use native apps that wrap a web view, a full-screen web view, and make, uh, make it possible to deploy cross-platform apps by using web technologies. And it also makes native APIs available through JavaScript. So you can actually, on, you know, your web, on the JavaScript level, you can hook into stuff that actually happens 
natively on the phone, and it tries to do that in a unified way. So the idea is to have like, you know, an abstraction, abstraction layer on top you know, across all these platforms. Um, top code, as I said, is like this uh, Twitter bootstrap for mobile apps. It's really great. If, if, you ever design, if you ever happen to build a Cordova app and you, um, you know, want to get something off the ground real quick, I highly recommend that. Um, it's also like built with, the, uh, with performance in the back of their head. So uh, in order to compete with like native apps, you know, performance is key. And um, there's a lot of things you can do wrong. If you, if you like went to a bunch of talks yesterday, the, you, you probably noticed that there are a lot of things you can do wrong using you know, interactivity and like, uh, styles and all that to like, just like, bring down the performance of your app. And it's obviously more important on mobile phones than it may be on desktop just because of the computation power. Um, <coughs> that brings me to Appium. Appium is uh, the test automation framework that I'm going to use uh, in my demo that I'm going to show you in a second. Uh, Appium is, a, is an app effort to uh, basically um, create a unified test automation API, which is based on the WebDriver JSON pro uh, web, web driver wire protocol, uh, which is very well accepted by uh, implementations for Selenium WebDriver for the browsers. So there are like uh, language native bindings out there in all kinds of languages. You don't have to, you're not locked into a certain technology to do test automation. It's very open. And Atmium is basically the server that uh, uses native um, like native developer tools of iOS, of Android, of Firefox OS to do the back-end automation part. So you, you have a unified API. You don't have to worry about the, you know, the, the back-end part of it. Um, I heavily contributed to this earlier this year. Uh, my coworker, Jonathan, is basically working on this full time. It's entirely open source. All of this is obviously open source. Um, it's, it's, it's a great thing. Um, I'll show you in a second. So um, a couple of things about Atmium. Those are kind of like the, the, the highlight points or like the driving factors behind it. Um, there are a bunch of like, competitor, like com competitors in the open source space that do kind of the same, but they don't have these um, like guidelines that we build it on top of or like these cornerstones, which is that you, shouldn't inst you should not have to instrument your app in order to test it. The idea behind it is like you should be able to test the app in the way that you're submitting it to the app store. Like no SDKs, no embedded web servers or anything like that. That's like one of the really big driving factors because once you modify your app, you don't know if that's going to cause you know, issues when you deliver it because most likely you're going to take that instrumentation out, uh, instrumentation out before you deliver it to the app store. Um, as I said, you want to write your test in any language. Um, as far as I know, like, even for exotic languages, there are like uh, web driver, Selenium web driver compatible bindings out there. So you can code your, your tests in everything from CoffeeScript to Perl, uh, you name it. Um, it builds on top of like, well-accepted automation standards that are, by nature, uh, grown out of the web, uh, you know, the web browser area, but we basically try to, um, since the ideas are kind of the same, uh, like, you know, evolve them to use mobile, and a bunch of uh, my coworkers are involved in uh, you know, standardization process with the, with the guys from WebDriver and for, um, to get that into the WU3C spec. So it becomes a legit web you know, technology standard. And uh, on top of that, there's actually a lot of traction that that project got ever since. And you know, I highly recommend to like, take a look if you guys are working on mobile apps. Uh, and and um, I'm going to use an emulator and a simulator. Uh, they kind of call it differently in, in iOS and in Android uh, to execute a test. But you can, you can literally attach a real device to your computer and, and run it on your device instead of uh, running it in a simulator. And uh, I brought a Nexus uh, One tablet. If any one of you guys want to see how that works, I can show you later. I just don't have the time today. Um, all right, so Cordova is this, um, this framework that wraps a web view, which is basically like a, you know, a full screen browser in a native app, right? And that's the way it deploys or like it gets the functionality out to uh, all the different platforms. And uh, the great thing about that is that um, if we're talking to a website, this whole automation you know, um, process is basically unified because always web technology is always the same across the platforms. Supposedly, it's the same. I mean, it relies on the idea that like, everybody implements a standard, right? Which they, which they do most of the time. Um, but it's not, it's not as different as like, you know, you have Android and you have iOS and you have very different uh, frameworks or like very different APIs. So that's great. Um, also, Appium supports um, talking to the native part of the app or talking to the web view part. So they're different contexts. Uh, they're context, and you can switch back and forth between them. So you can automate the web part of the app, which is the web view, which is for Cordova, the actual app. 
But there are things that you you know you can test through the web app if you're hooking like if you have events hooked up to some native API that JavaScript exposes through Cordova. So sometimes you have to switch from the web view context to um, the native context in order to like automate something and then switch back. Um, so uh, the great thing is that you're actually using the same exact protocol, but the semantics change because in, in one way you're talking to uh, nat the native part, and the other way you're talking to the web view part, which is you know web technologies. Um, the way that it looks like is um, I tried to make it a little bit uh, clearer by providing a code example. So the top one here is talking to native code. It's, as you can see, it uses like a kind of familiar DOM type of like lookup, get elements by tag name. But in fact, a tag name here doesn't, doesn't mean a tag name. It doesn't, it doesn't mean like I'm looking for a, a span or a diff or something. It looks, it in fact uses a, a, a UI component class, which is a table cell. Um, and it will t return all of them so you can do something within your automation script. Um, the idea here is to use the exact same API, and it's already you know, specified, so you're not going to change it. But uh, you can use the same semantics and just, you know, for now, forget that you're not really looking for a tag name. It's just a UI compon component class. But it works, it works just fine. Um, down below is um, the, um, the counterpart. It's like when you switch to the web view context, you look for a span, you get a list of spans, and you can work against it. In between, you have to do a bunch of other commands to uh, let uh, you know, Admium know you want to talk to native for the web view part. OK, um, without all further ado, let's just run the tests. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to run the tests on iOS first. Bring up the simulator. I dropped some uh, delays in there, so it will execute a little bit slower, so we can actually see how it, um, you know, does its magic. And like on the side here is Mocha as a test runner. And it will just do the BDD style uh, interface and you know, show you uh, what, what tests are executing at the moment. It gets a little bit more exciting towards the end. So um, like the setup phase is usually a little bit slow. Um, so this one is really interesting. I'm like switching to the native view at the end, and I'm scrolling up. I do a flick up, which you can't do through the web uh, automation uh, or like the web context part of it, as you can see here. Um, so I mean, this is, uh, this is pretty cool stuff, but uh, it gets even better because I'm using the same exact code and run the same tests on Android without changing anything. So you basically can automate cross-platform, but you use the same exact test cases. Like you don't have to implement like very different code to like do the tests. Um, here there was a, like a dialog box, like a modal dialog that I clicked. It's also a native um, you know, uh, API that gets called. And I'm going to show you the code and how that works and how you can switch in, into the native context from the web view context. But before we do that, I'm going to kick off the Android test so you can see that it does the same thing for Android. So this is the Android simulator, uh, emulator. And uh, hopefully it'll bring up the app. You can see it's running. And uh, let's move it a little bit. On the right side, in Mocha, you can see how it executes the tests. So yeah, it does the exact, exact thing. It's a little bit redundant to like, watch it all uh, happening because it takes a while. Um, let's go back to the presentation. Um, so my test implementation, I'm going like, to dive into a little bit of code here, is based on, it's all, you know, it's all Node. It's uh, JavaScript. The, the bleeding edge part here is that I'm using node uh, 0 dot, uh, point 0.11 that comes with like uh, ES6 and Harmony. Um, and I'm using a part of it or like a uh, part of the specification, which is generators. Um, test code is fundamentally synced because, uh, you know, user interaction is, you, you know, a user can only do so much and it's usually like one thing at a time. So using callbacks, as much as I don't have a problem with callbacks, like the code just grows to the right, unless you break it up in functions. But then it's not as coherent. So uh, my coworker Jonathan, he built uh, a library called um, uh, Monocle, which is a port from a Python equivalent that basically uses generators to um, make this API a little bit nicer. And like, um, what it does is like you yield callbacks here, as you can see here, and it will unwrap them and return um, the value for you. So up here, that's a better example. It yields a selector and it returns the value. And when you hit a yield, uh, node won't move on. It will like, e like pause execution right there. And then uh, later on, when the value comes back, it returns the value and keeps going. So 
This is a very short example, but as you can see, it's all like nicely lined up, and it's from a from a test authoring point of view, it's just nicer to read, in my in my opinion. Um, all right, let's look at the code. So, <clears throat> so I spent a lot of time on actually like creating a nice API on top of Mocha, and like uh, that basically takes care of like getting your app like set up on the on the simulator, which mostly AppMium does. But I kind of want to abstract that away from the user, or, like from the from the developer in that in that sense. So I created like a nice API where you can basically just drop in like the package name and the action name, which is you know some like stuff that you need to. Uh, specify when you create a Cordova app. It's always basically the same thing. But, and then you can basically just start coding tests. You don't have to worry about Android or iOS. You set that through an environment variable that the test runner picks up on. Um, so it's a BDD-style uh, interface that I coded against. And as you can see here, there's a describe block. And, um, and I'm like basically calling this before each method that um, will just activate the web view, and then I just write my test code. Uh, without going into much detail here, the thing that I wanted to highlight is like this here is the actual test, like the, the yit statement. It's a yield it. I just made, you know, shortened it. And um, it's basically just a sequence of steps. It's really easy to read. I'm using CSS selectors mostly to get hold of elements and click on them and like retry values. And then I you know, use like a, as a, as an assertion framework to just make sure that you know, what I'm expecting is actually happening. Um, what's really interesting here is that, that part down here. I built this uh, method, uh, or like this function. It's actually a generator, but it's uh, wrapped in a, in, a, in a function. It's called native sequence, and that lets you, whatever you put in there will, ex will be executed in, in the native context and not in the web view context. So uh, the interesting thing is I'm di dismissing a modal dialog here. And as you can see up here, this is the, the function definition, or actually the generator. Um, this is obviously different because iOS and uh, and Android are different in, in the ways you have to interact with like native code. So there's a little bit of like platform specific stuff that you have to do. But whenever you talk to the web view, it's the exact same code. All right. Um, so what's next? So since I said like every you know mobile app should be tested in an automated way, um, it should also be part of a build, right? So um, I thought like the scope of this talk is already you know pretty um, comprehensive. So. I didn't want to get CI in there and, and all that kind of stuff, but like, um, it's essential if you know if you want to do that on a uh, in an automated fashion to make it part of a build running on a you know Jenkins server or Travis or Strider, any of those uh, open source solutions or proprietary solutions for that matter. Um, the great thing is that like my employer Sauce Labs, we're running uh, AppMium in the cloud, and if you happen to work on an open source project, we do that for free, so you can just use that. Um, Otherwise, it's a really good way of like, scaling, because uh, executing functional tests are way slower than unit tests. And executing them at scale like, on a single machine can take a while. So that's a great, um, great way of like, getting around this problem. And especially if you're doing open source, you don't have to worry about you know, costs or anything like that. A good starting point for all this is um, our smoke tests. Right? Like you, you just want to see, is your most important flow through the app working? Like, let's say you. You're booking something, and then you have a credit card checkout process, or the credit card is already in the system. You just want to make sure that the user gets from end to end. So smoke tests are a good starting point, but you know the more the merrier, obviously. Um, it's it's really important to not confuse unit tests with functional tests. So the great thing is, like, since we're working on the web, you can you can heavily test your small parts of the code using JavaScript unit tests. The only problem that you have with that is that you obviously when you code them in in Chrome or in Firefox, they're not running on the actual device, right? So it's a good way of having like integration tests like wrapped up in functional tests. So, um, it fulfills a bunch of pur like well, a lot of purposes for that matter, um, and yeah, it's 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 great stuff. And you know what? It's all open source, so the tools are out there. They work. And I did this proof of concept implementation here that I'm going to op open source, and everyone can look at it and use it and make it better. And um, and that's why I'm saying every app should be uh, tested in an automated way because it's you know it's available. The tools are there. There's no excuse. Um, and that's uh, basically all I've got. And um, I have a bunch of links here. Um, Atmium, I always like the, the automation framework. Uh, please check that out. Um, we can always use contributions in any kind of way, sample codes, um, fixing bugs, all that kind of stuff. Um, Gapmium is like, you know, PhoneGap and Atmium. This is like what I showed you. This is basically the, the sample app that I used, and it has code in there that like, does this whole nice abstraction using generators and all that, which hopefully will end in node 0 0.12.
so you don't have to use the Harmony uh, command line option to activate them. Um, and it also, it will have all this code. I haven't pushed it out yet, but it will. Uh, I just want to follow the community process of getting it in there. Um, yeah, and other than that, there's Cordova uh, and Top Code. Cordova is really great. Um, so it was the first time I got my hands basically dirty with uh, Cordova, but it's, it's a really great framework, and it also uh, gives you a, a multitude of like, uh, APIs so you can like, interact with the actual app. So you, can, you can set geolocations. You can get the battery life status and all that. Um, so check that out. Feel free to like, uh, hit me up on Twitter if you have questions or like, come you know, find me, talk to me. I can show you how to execute that stuff on a real device or show you the guts of the test code or like, what's behind it and all that. And other than that, um, that's all I have. So we have five minutes of Q&A, I guess. Thank you. I love that the guy that looks like me he talked about phone gap. That's awesome. <laughs> it also uh, gets you cheaper haircuts. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Max from Mozilla, um, mm -hmm. working on Firefox OS localization infrastructure and stuff like that. Um, one thing that we've been looking at is actually doing screenshots as part of the automated testing so that you can actually have a visual test afterwards mm -hmm. without waiting for the whole execution part. Right. Have you thought about stuff like that? I think this is actually in the making. I'm not sure what platform I supported so far. Um, I know that like on our platform on Sauce Labs, it works because it's built into the service. Um, but I think fundamentally we want the, the, the framework that we're using to support it and not you know, make that dependent on the platform. I do know that my coworker Jonathan worked with uh, Malini Das from Mozilla, who's like working on Marionette to actually get Firefox OS support in there. And as far as I know, that actually works. I don't know the extent of it. But uh, if you want to know more about this, feel free to check out the project. And you know, if, if you can't find a screenshot, feel free to create a GitHub issue, and then we can get it in the whole community process and all that. There's also, uh, I can shoot you a link, but there's plugins for that for Cordova, for iOS and Android. Actually, I have a question for you. Does Firefox OS implement a screenshotting API? It does? Cool. Uh, That's the benefit that you get when your host is actually the author of the framework you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any uh, more questions? Come on, guys. I, I have a question, actually. Are you guys going to start doing work with uh, Medic, uh, which is the continuous integration stuff that Phil and I wrote uh, for Cordova? Um, I mean, Phil works for us now, so there's, there's a good chance. <laughs> 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 I'm, well, trying, I, I'm trying to dig out the info <laughs> on this one. I, I mean, uh, I, would just, I would say it's not impossible. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm just not deeply involved. I'm just kind of like, I was curious about Cordova and, and how that works with automation. I wanted to do a proof of concept, and now I'm talking about it. But um, potentially, yeah. Cool. Can I say that was a really sweet use of generators? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty slick, yeah. Um, I mean, like, I can't take the credit for it. I really have to like, give my coworker, um, Jonathan, here, Jonathan Lips, all the credit for it. Um, the good thing is like we, uh, he ported the implementation of uh, Python Twisted that we use internally in, in Saucer for our infrastructure. So he had a really nice API already that you know, have, we've been using for a couple of years. Um, I think it's great, too. Um, there's a little bit of controversy behind like, how to handle errors, which is really not a big deal in test code, because when an error happens, you just want it to bubble up and like, have the test runner like, uh, make it visible to you. Um, there may be a little bit more work required to actually use it in a different way, but it's, you know, it's pretty great. It makes code uh, super nice, but yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks. Cool. So um, give, uh, give my doppelganger a round of applause, and we'll, we'll have, um, we'll yeah, have a couple minutes to set up uh, the next talk with Alan.